Fire Arrowid is executive director of the Arrowid Center and head archivist for Arrowid.org. She is the site's primary information architect, designer, and editor. Earth Arrowid is Arrowid Center's technical director and the chief software engineer of Arrowid.org. He designs and implements the custom software systems necessary for managing the large flow of information through the site. These folks are researchers, the librarians of the field, if you will, conduits, really, and a precious resource to us all. So I'm going to turn you over to Earth and Fire. Our State of the Stone talks kind of morph and carry on tradition started by Terence McKenna when he gave a series of talks he called State of the Stone. They were kind of more wide ranging, but they included updates on new drugs and the current state of psychedelic stuff. The world is changing pretty quickly these days and the world of drugs is, is even faster. With new developments continually being made in chemistry, botany, types of use, law enforcement, distribution methods, everything. We began the Airwood project with the idea of collecting the existing knowledge about psychedelics and other recreational drugs in order to help to make sure that people in high school and college don't have to rely solely on their peers to make decisions about the plants and chemicals that they're going to ingest. So a big part of our work is tracking all of those various trends and distribute that information. So what we're going to do today is sort of do a quick walk through what's current and new. There's been a lot of news in the last two weeks, and so we're going to be jumping through some stuff pretty fast. This is just a quick rundown of the last six or seven years. 2006 through 2009, the spice and uh, synthetic cannabinoids were a really big new market, you know, slick packaged uh, cannabinoids being sold in, in convenience stores around the world. The last couple of years, there have been additional euphoric stimulants, cathinone stimulants, and the Enbome series, and now crocodile. In 2008 and 2009, a whole lot of the, both the bath salts and plant foods, as well as the synthetic cannabinoids, were being sold in the wide variety of corner stores. And that was a very big new trend. The last time we talked at Horizons a few years ago, the slick packaging, the mile hour packaging things were really big. Pretty much any convenience store around the United States had some kind of strange, slickly packaged psychoactive drug. That is kind of going away. It's now a little more reserved to head shops and things like that, but it's definitely still kind of dribbling along. A lot of the materials that were being sold then, and still true to some degree now, very pure chemicals that are being sold. A slightly different market than the underground black market. This is a sample of methoxetamine, a ketamine analog that we got tested in 2011. You can see that there's basically a single chemical present. It's an extremely pure material being, being shipped to people's doors. But there's obviously the problem that if one buys something from the online markets and things like that, you don't ever really know for sure what you're getting unless it gets analyzed. This is from a group that we really like, Exchange Supplies, but in Britain, they actually get funding from the government in Britain, and they produce amusing cartoonish documentation about heroin stuff, buprenorphine, IV injection guides and things like that, but they also cover a research chemical world. And they're sort of playing on the fact that though a lot of the materials that are being sold are extremely pure, there have been a lot of issues with the wrong pure chemical coming mislabeled. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very different harm reduction uh, issue to have contamination versus pure misidentified materials. So the, the, in, in 2011, a bunch of, in the United States, a bunch of the synthetic cannabinoids got controlled. They'd already been controlled in 2010 by a few countries, and they, they continue to slowly come out. More new synthetic cannabinoids are available, and then this year, the DEA scheduled three more, but there are continuing to be more out there. But there are still smoking blunt vendors that are up and running both in the U.S. and around the world these days often proclaiming on the packaging that there's no DEA banned substances in them. They don't actually identify what is in them, nor would any of us probably recognize the names of the chemicals if, if you've heard what they were. Legal but in all 50 states. <laughs> new, is that actually? New, 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 new brand, new blend of K2. The EMC DDA is one of the more important drug information sources. They're a European monitoring center for drugs and drug addiction. They're a little bit more on the law enforcement side, but they do quite a lot of interesting information collection. And this is a chart from the last few years showing the number of brand new substances which had never been previously identified by them. So in 2006, there were only eight. Then in 2012, there were 73. I believe this year, 2013, as of the middle of the year, they were on track to be higher than 73, more like 100 brand new, never before identified substances that they're seeing available for sale online to the public. This is a chart that shows the top substances available by the number of shops that were selling them for January, July of 2011, and then January of 2012. So the top substance that was available was Kratom, which I actually thought was interesting. 
and then salvia divinorum, psychoactive mushrooms, methoxetamine, MDAI. You know, there's 179 stores that were selling Kratom in January of 2012 that, of course, EMC DDA found, as opposed to, I was probably double that, I would guess, if they <laughs> knew where to look. Kratom is the common name for Mitrogyna speciosa. It's a plant that grows natively in Southeast Asia. And it's been available in the United States as a productized material for over 10 years now. But over the last few years, it's gone into these kind of slick mylar packaging. And it's getting used by both people who want to use it recreationally, as well as a way to stop the withdrawal suffering associated with opioids. It's kind of a quasi-opioid agonist, I think. This is just a photo that we took last week in Chicago as we were walking by a head shop. We stopped, stepped in the door, and there's Kratom on the top shelf. Of Captain the... Kratom. Captain Kratom. Mojo Pimp Kratom. Pimp, pimp Kratom. Pimp Kratom. I guess that's the good stuff right there. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Everyone knows MDMA, probably. Yeah. A bunch of the euphoric stimulants, the cathinone stimulants that have been coming out of the last five, six years, are chemical variants of MDMA or share a structure. And this is just to show how similar they are. MDPV is one of the substances that has been being sold as bath salts that have been getting a lot of media over the last few years. One of the curious things about this market is the, these products sometimes are products that continue over years but change what's in them over time. Because they don't actually identify on the packaging what the chemical is, they just have a brand name. It doesn't really matter whether it stays the same. So this is actually an example of a product that was called Charge, that in March 2010, a group called Energy Control in Spain did analysis of the product and found that it contained lidocaine and the psychoactive chemical 4-FMC. And then a year later, in February of 2011, they tested it, and it, they had added caffeine to the product. And then in May of 2011, they checked it, and they had completely changed it to caffeine and MDPV. So the same product being sold in the same packaging, containing different chemicals. I mean, in this case, over a three-month period, it completely changed what was in it. And we actually don't know for sure, but the, the uh, dosages of MDPV and 4-FMC are very different. We presume that they actually are padding one in order to make the dosage in the package, hopefully, the package is always one dose or two doses. Um, we don't actually know how that worked. <laughs> a fellow contacted us and said, I've had depression and chronic pain for a really long time, and I've been taking this plant food stuff, and I've actually, my depression's gone away, I've lost a lot of weight, I'm back at work, and I'm really excited about it. And he wanted to know what was in it. Uh, and, and he actually said that he had been, he had been using a product called, that, a substance called MDPV in Florida, but Florida had actually made MDPV illegal. And so he had started using this new product, which seemed like it was kind of the same, but he didn't really know, and so he wanted to get it tested to find out what was in it. And the label has, uh, says on it in tiny little print, this product does not contain, and then lists however many that is, 5-MeO-DMT, methadrone, ketamine, you know, just names all of these psychoactive drugs that it does not contain, including MDPV, which it has, I believe, in italics and bolded on it, because, of course, MDPV had been made recently illegal. We sent the sample in, and we got it tested through our lab, and it contains a single active chemical, MDPV, which is listed on the package as it, it not containing it. One of the things that continues to be true, unfortunately, is that the mainstream sources of information kind of fail, that even the better news sources often either get stuff wrong or are so bent on making sure that no one could misunderstand them as endorsing any of this unseemly behavior that they're willing to quote people saying the stupidest thing. The New York Times quoted this fellow as saying, if you take the worst attributes of meth, coke, PCP, LSD, and ecstasy and put them together, that's what we're seeing sometimes referring to bath salts. And of course, if you took all of the worst qualities of those drugs, no one would take it, right? <laughs> um, it, that's, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. One of the really terrible media crazes is the bath salt zombies. There was a particular case where there was a guy who seemed to go a little insane and attacked another guy, and then there was a lot of media about him having bit him. And there was bath salt zombies. He must have been on bath salts, and, the, and I believe it was the police chief um, stated to the media that, that he was, he was, they, were, they were really suspicious that he had been on bath salts. So there were, every media outlet had news about that. None of them, pretty much, uh, reported later on when they found out that he, they had, he had a little bit of cannabis in his system and nothing else. There was no evidence that he had taken MDPV or bath salts. Um, they were just basically making that up. But the bath salt zombie meme continued on for 
really long time. Even after the police announced that they had found no trace of any other drug other than probably had smoked cannabis a few days before or maybe eaten some a week before, this weird zombie meme continued. And then there were additional cases of people attacking people and everybody was speculating that, that all of them were bath salt related. It got so big that the CDC started playing on some of the zombie stuff and included in some press releases that you know, there's no zombie apocalypse and people should not be worried. Very irritatingly, in June last year, just after the police had announced that there was no MDPV found in this fellow, Congress then added MDPV to Schedule 1. Riding on the sort of wave of the media attention that it had been getting. The main thing that is obvious from our work is that it doesn't really matter why people don't sleep. If people don't sleep for two nights in a row, whether it's they keep taking LSD or they take bath salts or they take methamphetamine or or, or they just, they, stay just up. having a panic attack. Lack of sleep makes people crazy and stupid. Just go to sleep. <laughs> Stop taking the drugs. It's a pretty crazy world out there. This year we're on track for, according to EMC DDA, 80 and 100 brand new substances, and it's pretty hard to keep track of. We spend a lot of our time managing groups of volunteers who track new drugs that are available from vendors and surf the forums, and it's a lot to keep track of. One of the new drugs that's been getting a lot of media attention just in the last couple of weeks is actually crocodile. It's desimorphine, it's an opiate that was first seen in Russia getting attention because it has really sloppy synthesis from codeine. It's basically very impure as it hits the streets and people are injecting it and basically it turns out that if you inject really impure things, a lot of really bad things can happen. Body degradation through there being bad chemicals left over from the, from the, from the you know, synthesis process. It can, it can it, the, the people, Codeine is pretty easy to get around the world, relatively speaking, and it's, there's a kind of a crappy meth synthesis-like uh, method that can take codeine and turn it into desimorphine, which is then a little longer acting and a little, little more fun than codeine. And just to follow on the bad media model, just this morning, there was a brand new media article called Zombie Drug Gives High Rot Skin about Crocodile, so they just love the zombie meme. Oh, it can't be MVP, okay, doesn't... apparently it's Crocodile is the zombie drug. Everybody loves zombies. Who doesn't love zombies? <laughs> One of the outcomes of there being so many new drugs and such broad use and difficulty in tracking it is that there's a new model of testing for levels of use of various drugs in the city through testing the wastewater system because they detect quite low concentrations of drugs. It is that you can basically just go to the wastewater treatment center and, and test and see how the levels of, whether the levels of cocaine are going up or down over the course of a year. And so the first international conference on detecting, monitoring, and estimating the use of illegal drugs through wastewater testing took place in May of this year. So a whole conference on testing wastewater for drugs. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with one of the projects that we run is called Ecstasy Data, and it's actually a project that we have a DEA licensed lab that we work with. People can submit anonymous samples to. For tablets, we charge $40, and for powders, we've been charging $140, although this month the copay will go down to $100 because We've got a sponsor who's helping us pay for that. We subsidize about $12,000 a year in testing costs in order to try to make this thing happen. Um, and we think it's one of the most important uh, projects in, just in terms of, we would like to see the, uh, in the United States, uh, people be able to test the substances that they're, that they're taking so that they know what it is that they're taking. Well, we've been seeing a lot, it's, it's interesting, we've been seeing a lot more non-tablet samples being sent in as the, as the research chemical market is getting bigger and bigger. A lot of people sending in just white powders to say, is what I bought what I think I bought? Over the Labor Day weekend, there were a few deaths associated with a couple of big parties in the Northeast. And even though Molly is not actually a brand new term, the media seems to have lost track of <laughs> looking up things on Wikipedia. And, um, and so uh, we actually got contacted by a whole bunch, by seven different fairly sizable media organizations to talk to them about this new thing, Molly. And uh, over, like over a few days after Labor Day weekend, there were, um, uh, there were hundred, like 150 stories that we counted talking about Molly, and uh, around half of them got it wrong. Uh, it's, it's not that complicated, but it turns out that uh, new terminology is a little confusing, and common names are just sort of naturally imprecise. And one of, the, one of the big things that I think is, is sort of new about the, the slang name Molly is that traditionally it has been used to describe pure-ish powdered MDMA. Uh, more recently it has started uh, being used to mean powdered other psychedelic and or pathogenic stimulants. Through ecstasy data, through testing that we've done as well as through testing results that we collect from a couple of other groups, in particular energy control in Spain, we've had 80 different samples that have gotten tested of materials that were submitted as Molly. 
since 2000. Over the last 18 months, the samples are just about equally likely to be methylone as they are to be MDMA. There's a few other substances that are also showing up as moly in powder, but methylone is the primary one that we're seeing that is about as common as MDMA. One of the things that's confusing for young people, or anybody really, uh, is that if you buy something that's pure and, it's in a, and it gets sold as molly and it's methylone, uh, it's actually possible that, that one would consistently get something that is methylone in a baggie sold as molly. Uh, and methylone's dosages are higher, so even if one were, one were weighing the material, it might be reasonable to take 200 milligrams of methylone uh, for an, an evening and not be too high, but starting out with 200 milligrams, if you then buy another baggie of molly and it turns out to be MDMA, you take 200 milligrams, it might be way too much, especially if you take two doses or whatever. The deaths that have had their toxicology results published, one of them was supposedly just pure MDMA, but the person took six, so we don't know six what exactly, but six hits tablets, presumably, which is quite conceivably a very high dose. And another one of them was MDMA in combination with methylone. So we don't know if that was powder or if that was tablets that contained both or, or what. The easiest way to test things is, is in your own home or at a party. And um, the reagents are available from a variety of different companies that people can use to do field tests. And they aren't, they aren't, there's no way to use a field test to confirm, to absolutely confirm what a substance is or to verify that there are no contaminants. But it's a way that one can rule out certain things. Reagent tests are available on Amazon. And in the crazy world of 2013, Amazon helpfully provides a list of other products that you might be interested in. So people who bought drug testing reagents on Amazon also bought naphtha, 5-HTP, milligram scales, cannabis grinders, PCOL and TCOL by the Shulgans, whipped cream chargers and empty gel caps, uh, the Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley, earplugs, glow sticks, and a thousand tiny Ziploc bags. <laughs> One of the things that's been in the news for the last couple of weeks is Silk Road. There's an encryption system called Tor where, that people can use to visit sites anonymously, and Silk Road was a site that you could only visit through this anonymizing system called Tor. It was shut down a week and a half ago uh, by the FBI, who was supposedly shut down or whatever, the government shut down thing, but they seem to still be working. Um, <laughs> It wasn't just a place that one could go and buy things. It included a set of forums. It made me a little uncomfortable whenever I visited Silk Road, not because I was afraid for myself, but be just it was a little ag agitating to read the level of public discourse about buying and selling illegal drugs. And so the forums included vendor forums where there was like feedback. Oh, I bought heroin from Jim, and it was really good, but I bought it from... Sandy and it, whatever, and it wasn't as good, and, and vendor forums where they were discussing ways of shipping things so that they wouldn't get caught, including clean room techniques and making sure that your, their DNA didn't show up in, in, the, in the, uh, the envelopes, and actually talking about going to other places. Like if, if you ever go on a trip, uh, make sure to collect carp carpet samples and uh, carpet fiber samples and uh, pollens and dust and things like that from where you go, and then put that in your envelope so that, so that if, if, throw if, off the FBI. if anybody ever, if, if your DNA happens to show up, it will show up mixed with stuff that doesn't make any sense. One of the things that's been being sold across the internet has been a substance called 2,5-I in Bome, or 2,5-I for short. It's a psychedelic phenethylamine. What's most notable about it is that its dosages are extremely low, sort of half a milligram, 500 micrograms. Um, you know, a little higher than, than LSD, but not, not a lot higher. So it's, it's small enough dosage to actually be able to fit on blotter. This is just a photo of a couple of capsules showing one milligram at the bottom of the capsule, which is a little bit like a water spot. 10 milligrams, which is definitely enough to see and, and handle, and then 100 milligrams, which is actually pretty easy to handle. But it's very difficult, and it's really kind of inappropriate for teens to be able to buy grams of stuff that's active at under a milligram. There have been a lot of issues based on that because people are used to the idea that a white powder a small, a snorting a small line of it will be fine, for example, and that's, that's actually caused deaths because a, a line is a huge amount of, of 2,5-I. Most notably, I think that 2,5-I is now available on blotter, and so it used to be blotter was pretty much LSD. We're generally guessing, but it seems like half of the blotter that's randomly going At the around summer festivals this year in is, the is probably 2,5-I instead of LSD. We have done some testing through ecstasy data as well as through the energy control group. Water sold as acid in Spain this summer, 40% showed up as containing the Enbome compounds instead of, instead of LSD. There have been dozens of known publicized deaths around the world. DEA has announced that it recorded 14 known deaths in the U.S. 11 of those were from direct pharmacological effects. 
and three of them were from behavioral fatalities, getting injured to the point of death because they were really, really high. On Thursday, the DEA announced a one-month waiting period before they will temporarily schedule the endomic compounds. Then that's emergency scheduled for a while, and then it will be permanently scheduled after that. So there's a lot of different responses around the world to this phenomenon of lots of new drugs. The primary response around the world is to continue banning things, that prohibition will carry us through this terrible time. In Russia, uh, they, they decided to ban the information. So there's a, a list of banned sites in Russia that are, uh, the, Russia does not have a, like a China firewall kind of thing, but they have, um, uh, they have a list of sites that are domains that ISPs are legally obligated to block and Arrow is now part of that list. Um, in Britain, um, they're implementing a, a, an adult content filter, which is uh, supposed to be implemented by default by all ISPs, and uh, it's not clear exactly what will be blocked through that yet, but we are kind of expecting that eventually the drug web information websites will be blocked based on political decision making. But then in the U.S., obviously, two states have recently legalized cannabis, so that's sort of a different direction is, you, you know, you pick, you pick the least harmful of the materials and, and you know, start to try to back off on, on the law enforcement of those. It really looks to us like it's now pretty clear for the next few years that history has decided that uh, cannabis legalization will be moving forward. And the, the people who are the prohibitionists who are against cannabis legalization are now feeling like they're on the wrong side of history. And the, there's a discussions. There's a, there's a conference that's going, I can't remember exactly when it is, but it's later this year, maybe early next year. Uh, that's a, that's a, a conference dedicated towards um, trying to continue with the prohibition of cannabis. And they're actually going to the trouble of researching the people who sign up for tickets and disallowing anybody who is pro-cannabis from coming to the conference. They're having a hard time filling the conference with people who are against cannabis, and instead they're getting a lot of people who are going to come, I'm sure, and I don't know if they were going to do Smoke weed. we're going to do, probably. <laughs> One of the most interesting things going on is in New Zealand that they're actually trying something pretty different. Now, it's unclear how well this is going to go, but it was signed into law in July. It's called the Psychoactive Substances Act, and it creates a category for legal recreational drugs. And they have already approved several drugs to be manufactured and distributed. Instead of prohibiting everything that comes along, the theory is you al allow th some things to be sold, um, require labeling on the package, uh, so that people can report back any problems that, are, that, that come up and then um, uh, ban the ones or disallow the sale of the ones that actually hurt people. Um, that m maybe over time we would actually be able to have some social tonics, I think is one of the terms that's used, um, that uh, would be legal. In the end, one of the things that we're doing to work with the vast number of psychoactives that are available and deal with that in the modern world is to try to move forward in developing the idea of a wisdom cycle, of gathering the knowledge that is learned by people who have tried the various substances, who have worked with them throughout their lives, who feel as though they've had a good life experience with them, and learn from them what has created that positive experience and what makes for a healthy relationship with psychoactive drugs, and then try to pass that on to younger generations. And so we've been working on a survey, the Wisdom Cycle Survey Project, which is going to be a series of surveys. At this point in time, what we're doing is surveying elders about their experiences and trying to gather their knowledge. This is the early results from just this pilot survey that asked people partially for their life experiences, but also asked them what we should ask other people about. One of the interesting things was that 93% of the people that we asked uh, thought that psychedelics and pathogens can play a beneficial role in one's life. Hopefully we'll be finding out how to describe what works for people and what doesn't work for people. Join me in thanking Earth and Fire Arrowhead. Thank you very, very much. One, for outside resources, who are some of your favorites and most accurate? And the other question is, of all these new synthetics coming out, which would scare you the most in terms of harm reduction? There are a couple of f fairly large-scale surveys of what drugs people use in the United States, and there's a few others in other countries. Um, the United States probably has the best one, and that my favorite is Monitoring the Future, which um, is started in the 1970s and asks students in high school, and uh, I guess eighth through eighth, That's tenth, eighth, and, grade they start. eighth, tenth, and twelfth grade, and uh, then they actually take a subset of the people that they've that they surveyed in twelfth grade and continue to follow up with them. So they do a longitudinal thing. So they've been following some people from, from the mid-1970s through today. And uh, one, one of the things that's really inter interesting about there is the recanting rates. Right. So, so because they've been following people over a long period of time, they actually are able to track 
so, so let's say you ask an a, a eighth grader, have you ever used LSD? And then you ask them in ninth grade and 10th grade and 11th grade and 12th grade, and then I think it's every five years yep. maybe after that. Three and then five. Yeah. Um, sometime in their late 30s or mid 40s, a lot of people start saying, no, I've never tried LSD, even though they previously filled out on the survey that they had tried LSD. And so it's sort of an interesting tracking of, of what the data probably means if you just ask people who are 40 if they ever took LSD. People are in the middle of their careers and they don't really want to, to write down on a piece of paper, you know, rightfully so, that, that, they, that they took a, very, a particular drug. Um, but by doing it through a longitud longitudinal you know, process, they are actually able to see what that you know, level is of, of how many people lie. <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the surveys have, are pretty complicated because in terms of the, taking the results and actually extrapolating them to the whole population, which they almost always do, it, because the, a lot of the surveys aren't really anonymous and there's no trust built up. So like somebody, you know, the, what used to be called the National Household Survey, now called the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, uh, they, they go to people's homes and, and then ask them questions about their illegal drug they use. They go to people's homes and ask kids questions in front of their parents. So not, you can't always interpret the results uh, straightforwardly. Um, and in terms of drugs that we are afraid of, um, I, I, you know, uh, it's pretty much any new drug, anything that's, you know, really brand new in the last couple of years shouldn't be available to the public in a large... In a, in Not quite as many people should be trying it because it's what they can get easily. You know, it's, it's they, they don't really... It's, it's a little bit like using teens as lab rats, um, yeah. which is okay, sort of. Um, <laughs> Uh, better than using me as a web rat. Some of the ones that I'm most concerned about are actually some of the downers, some of the things which are central nervous system depressants. Um, there are some PCP analogs that are a little concerning in terms of uh, how people are using them. But I've also been concerned about the embomase. I mean, there were, there, the, the, the combination of the extremely low doses, the uh, um, presenting them on blotter and having a lot of uh, that sold as acid so that people don't really know exactly what they're, they're taking, and deaths at, it seems like deaths are happening at five to ten times of what the dose that, that people are wanting to take. Now, five to ten times a normal dose of LSD doesn't really cause death ever. But, and so people are not really aware that three or four hits of water could conceivably contain too high of a dose of a brand new, right. of, a, of a substance. And so, you know, I've been watching that and, and not really liking it. Now, I don't know if emergency scheduling it is the right answer, but... It, what happened? <laughs> what exactly is meth alone? And what are the odds today getting LSD? That's really what you're going to get. And how would you be able to tell? Meth alone is a euphoric stimulant that is MDMA light in, in, in terms of general, their general class. Its dosage range is sort of in the 100 to 250 range uh, per dose. People sometimes often, I would say often redose. That's not necessarily recommended. I'm just saying what people do. Um, uh, I'm not really sure what else to say about it. It's been it's been it's been quite popular. Uh, uh, and in terms of in terms of how likely LSD uh, blotter acid is to LSD specifically, it, it's a it's a network problem. It's not like if you're a, a person if you live next door to a person with a kilogram of LSD, they're going to do everything they can to keep you from knowing about that. And so you might be really really close to really good LSD. But you are, if you're outside the network of distribution, you won't get it. And so the, uh, in terms of gu guessing what the, I mean, like if you go to a, a random festival and go shopping by listening to people's yelling doses or whatever, um, it's, it's hard to guess what. It's really hard to guess. But uh, there's, you know, there is a lot more LSD now than there was seven years ago on the streets. But um, uh, it, in the 90s, it was really easy to get relatively reliable LSD, and it's not anymore. How well do you think the drug testing market is keeping up with newer synthetics or impurities? It's a big commercial market, and they're always trying to keep up. They're trying to advertise new services and sell new products. The government approved things that like bus drivers and, and folks like that have to, take, have to uh, get tested for are a more limited set and changes much more slowly. Uh, but. It's also the standard test that most employment tests would test for. They, they basically, they're, they're not keeping up very much. I mean, they're, they, are, they continue to develop tests that will test for newer substances, but they aren't used generally. 
that those tests are not generally used. And so, you know, if there's some particular reason for law enforcement or an employer to suspect a particular strange new research chemical, it's possible they could test for it. But, but if you just are doing standard employment testing, they're not testing for any of the new substances. I'm curious if the 25i was named similar to LSD-25? No, um, it's actually a chemical variant of, another name for it is 2CB. Or 2CI. And Bome, or 2CI and Bome, and so it's actually a variant of 2CI. The 2C compounds have this sort of extra wing attached, which makes them much more potent in, in a kind of LSD-like way, but uh, the 25 is related to the counting the where things attach to each other. Who's actually making all these synthetics and putting them in the glossy packaging. It's unfortunately it's pretty common. Um, the Silk Road was a, a big source of pre-dosed blotter that was specifically people were selling on Silk Road stuff to be sold as acid. It was it had like uh, Albert Hoffman bicycle ride blotter and other things which were very clearly LSD designed blotter, blotter designed to hold LSD that then got dosed with uh, the the Nbome compounds. Um, but, but, there's I, a, but there's also been a lot of Silk Road blotter that was being sold with 25i on it. it. was being sold specifically labeled as 25i, but then how many, you know, a couple people down the chain and you've got blotter and who wants 25i instead of LSD, so you just say it's LSD instead. And, and it's been, so it's be, hard because, to know exactly where that's all happening. The higher the potency of the substance, the easier it is to get, easier it is to get a lot of doses through customs or through mail. And so, you know, a standard letter envelope it goes up to 28 grams um, uh, in it. And so one imagines that one could fit 15 grams of material in a letter envelope pretty easily. And 15 grams of 25i and Bome is, uh, you know, 25,000 doses or something like that. It has been quite easy for people to buy stuff le legally um, and, and then uh, do, what they want with it. do what they want with it. Thank you so much. Beautiful job. <laughs>